And welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author, Father Cedric Pesenia, CP. His book, Death, The Final Surrender, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog. Welcome, Father. It's great Doug, to, see to see you, you again. again. Yeah. People see you on, on the network. Uh, you've done some preaching at some of the masses. Obviously, your series, several books. Now, this is actually a revised edition of an earlier book. Why did you decide to put out a new edition? Well, I added some material because uh, people were talking about grieving, and I didn't have anything about grieving in this book, so I added that. I added some material about the resurrection, the resurrected body, St. Thomas Aquinas. I added some other material that people would want to know about, mm -hmm. and it's a special EWTN version. Okay. Now, you talk about out of the 24 books you've written, congratulations, this is uh, the most popular, and do you think it's because it deals with death? Absolutely. People want to know what's going to happen when we die. That's the great mystery that we have in life. When I die, what happens? Now, we've all read books about the afterlife and about heaven and this various things, but this book specifically intentionally talks about the death moment, the death experience, and what we can expect. I've never read another book like this. This is an amazing book. Right, and you, you talk about the fact that in this you talk about your own near-death experience and you delineate between dying and a death experience. Why don't you tell us the difference? Well, dying is what that deterioration process that happens as we grow older. You know, we diminish, we get older, and some people have to go to a nursing home and you have all kinds of medical mm -hmm. care. That's the dying process, the death moment is what I talk about in this book, mm -hmm. what we can expect. And it comes from my experiences, my two near-death experiences when I was 20 years old, where God, and I had been praying for wisdom, mm -hmm. God showed me what's going to happen in the wisdom that I got. That comes from Psalm 90, teach us to number our days, teach us wisdom of heart. It's interesting in the book, you talk about the fact that you began to search before this occurred. Yeah. What made you start to search? Well, I had had a breakup with a girl and I was a teenager and I was kind of lost and I began to search my Catholic faith that I grew up with but I wasn't really practice, practicing and after months of praying and seek and you will find this happened mm -hmm. this being these two near-death experiences one month apart from each other totally revolutionized my life mm -hmm. totally changed me and led to me becoming a Catholic priest. And I have to say this, Doug, I grew up Catholic. I was born and, born and uh, baptized a Catholic. I was confirmed in the eighth grade. I was never even an altar boy. Mm -hmm. Religion did not really, it was not a big thing for me. Right. But when this happened and God revealed himself to me and what's gonna happen when we die, I totally right. changed. I have now been a religious for 36 years. I've been a priest for 30 years as we film this. Mm -hmm. I travel around the country preaching missions. I'm on the three major Catholic, uh, Christian networks. God has wants me to proclaim what happened to me. Right. Now, now one of the things you mentioned here, too, that I thought was interesting, we, we live in a, a death-denying culture. Yeah. Many elderly are sent away to homes and removed from the mainstream of the community. Emphasis is on exercise, drugs, and staying eternally young. That's why people are trying to deny that they're ever going to die. It's interesting, though. Do you think part of the reason, besides uh, the amount of care that's needed, that to some degree we shuttle those who are, uh, you know, dying or becoming unable to care for themselves because we don't want to deal with it, we don't want to look at it? That is absolutely true. We don't want to face our own mortality, and that's in our culture. It's a culture of youth and sports, and I'm not against those things, mm -hmm. but. I, what I love about our church is we're not a death-denying church, we're a death-defying church. Mm -hmm. We proclaim resurrection. Think about Paul the Apostle, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Jesus. Now you talk about your own near-death near experience. Why don't you, now you were watching a, a Boston Red Sox baseball game, so I can understand why that might have caused you <laughs> difficulties. Uh, but True why don't you Yankee explain fan. exactly what happened? What happened was I went to bed. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'm 20 years old. All of a sudden, as I'm going to sleep, I had this experience of feeling like I was leaving my body. Mm -hmm. This had never happened to me before. You know, I'm a spiritual person, but I didn't really think I was all that spiritual. I'll put it to you this way. Uh, there was, there's been some books out by Raymond Moody. He's mm -hmm. a doctor, and he talks about life after life, the near-death experiences. 
I didn't know anything about these. This is about when people are on the operating table and they have, they lose their vital signs and they pass away and then they come back a little while later and they report these, these, uh, these symptoms. They say that they feel like they left their body, they went through a tunnel, mm -hmm. they met God, a being of light, they had a judgment, they came back and they had a changed life. Mm -hmm. Now those are the elements of a common, the common elements of a near-death experience. That's how I talk about what happened to me. We can call it a near-death experience, mm -hmm. but it was a meeting of God. Mm -hmm. And I went through those very same things, had the, had the feeling of leaving my body. I went through some type of a tunnel. Mm -hmm. I, on the cover of the book. But you didn't want to go. I didn't want to go. You didn't want to go. That's a great, that's a great statement. Right. When you're about to go before God, and I knew where I was going, when a meeting with God is imminent, it's terror. <laughs> uh, that comes from the scriptures. It's, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. No, I don't want to, we'll talk about God's love here in a minute, but I just want to say when it's imminent, think about the disciples up on Mount Tabor and the fear that they felt when they mm -hmm. saw that Shekinah cloud of God. They fell on their face and they were afraid. And then Jesus had to touch them and said, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want to go, but I went. And it was more like a magnet drawing me there. And then, of course, coming before God, we're, we're made for the beatific vision. You know, we can talk about that. And then I had this judgment that I wasn't right. Then I came back, and now, as you can see, my life has changed. Well, we, we, we appreciate that you, you took the right route coming out. You said, as I went through my experience, I made a mental note to myself that everything on Earth seems so safe and secure. Things are definitely not what they seem. And I guess with the COVID going on over the last year, we know that life on Earth is illusory. What I mean is that when we think or act or live, we feel like we are the only ones present. But just beneath the surface uh, of our thoughts and consciousness, there's this whole new transcendent reality. The other analogy you made in the sense is like, a lot of times our life is like we go on vacation for two weeks and while we're in the middle of vacation it seems like it's going to be a long long time right then suddenly it's over right another analogy would be a two-way mirror mm -hmm. that when we're before a two-way mirror somebody behind can see what we're doing but we don't see them we don't even notice them somehow some way God is able to see our life as it's happening but we're not aware of it that's what transcendence is. You transcend this, this experience. Mm -hmm. By the way, I never knew what the word transcendent meant. Mm -hmm. It was not a part of my vocabulary until these experiences happened to me. Also, the word justification didn't really know what it meant until I came before God and I realized that I wasn't justified and God was inviting mm -hmm. me to be justified. Of course, we're justified by the blood of Christ and by our deeds. It's both and. You talk about in a section on being reborn, I believe that we will die as we have lived. How so? Well, if you've lived a virtuous life in faith, believing, giving your life to Christ, you will die with great assurance and great comfort. Mm -hmm. But if you've lived a selfish life, a life that you haven't been connected with God, then you're going to die in regret, mm -hmm. unfortunately. You want to say, I believe that most people who do not accept the gospel and give their lives to Christ are prideful, controlling people who live for themselves. You go on to say, I believe we have an inherent desire to grasp for control. Control is a blessing and a curse. You go on to say, when some people face these situations where they lose control, they can't control, they find their life unmanageable. And then you go on to say, pride is the epitome of grasping for control. I want to say that I do a lot of ministry in the 12-step program. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why people get into addictions is because they want to be in control, they think they're in control, and ironically, the way out of it is to lose control. So in, in many ways in life, we have a semblance of control, but the bottom line is, Doug, we don't know mm -hmm. in terms of what diseases we might get, we don't know when we're going to die, we don't know how we were going to be born, male or female, where we were going to be born, to who. So much of our life is out of control, and we think we're in control and we're not. And in this near-death experience, when I had to surrender control of everything as I came to God, I realized that we have a semblance of control, but the bottom line is we are not in control. That's why, as I talk about, surrender is so very important, surrendering to God. Day in and day out, we must abandon ourselves to God, and then you will die as you have lived. Mm -hmm.
In the section six, the voice of the Lord, I heard the sound of God's voice while I was in this presence of God communicated to me telepathically. Well, a lot was probably said. I only remember two phrases the whole time I was before God. The first was, I will protect you. The second, you must justify your soul. Right. God speaks to us even now through the Holy Spirit telepathically. Mm -hmm. It's, it's in an, a voice that we can understand a language we can understand, but not an audible voice. Mm -hmm. And we can discern it as you get better in prayer. You can discern it to some degree. This was very understandable. Right. And it wasn't a loud, audible voice. It was a knowing. It was right. a transfer. It's like put on your heart kind of a sense. You get, but it was right? very clear. Right. There was no doubt in my mind. And the two things that God said, I will be protected, and God has protected me, although I go through trials like everybody else. And he told me that I wasn't right and that I needed to justify my soul. And as I said, we are justified by the blood of Christ, by his passion, but also by our good works in faith. We are justified in being justified. That's good Catholic theology. Now, in a section uh, later on, providential protection, you talk about John Paul II being, you know, with uh, Lady of Fatima and the shooting. Then you go on and talk about your dad telling you a story about the fact that he was supposed to be on a, I think it was a submarine. Yeah. And he got transferred and that sub never came back. And so you say, well, that's providentially positive for him. But then the question you ask here, which is good, what about those who went down in that submarine that day? Where was God's protection in their lives? Where was, what happened to the guy who replaced your father on that right. submarine? That's a good question. We're talking about why do bad things happen to good people? And we don't know all the answers to that question, but this is what I put in the revision to my book. I talk about how when we go before God, get this, this is a scripture verse, we will know as we are known. Mm -hmm. I talk about the Nazi Holocaust. I talk about the Armenian Holocaust. I talk about the pandemic. I talk about suffering, mm -hmm. cancer. I talk about abortions. Why does a good God allow all these things to happen? And we have all these questions, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of confusion and a lot of doubt. Especially young people have that, I think, today. It's a big Absolutely. Big when you come to faith, you, you start to trust. And, and I want to say in, in one word, trust God. When I came before God and I stood before God, all of those questions melted away. I was known as I, I knew as I was known. Mm -hmm. And I, those are just words, Doug. I want to talk about really quickly St. Thomas mm -hmm. Aquinas. He had a vision of God right before he died. Mm -hmm. Aquinas was a prolific writer, a doctor of the church. Right before he dies, he has this beautiful, glorious vision of God. And then he says, all that I have written is straw. straw. Right, right, right. <laughs> and what I want to say is, all that I have written, if I could put it into two words, trust God. Right. Trust God. Right. That's the meaning of our now life. Now you say, uh, you ask your question, why was I given this uh, near-death experience? You say, because I needed it, because you needed to get on the right path. Uh, what about people, who, what if it was something like you and that didn't happen to you? Uh, how could, and you uh, didn't uh, end up in the right place. Uh, yeah. What yeah. happened to the guy next door who was watching the same game and he didn't have that experience? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, that's in the mystery of God, but I will say right. what Jesus said, blessed are you who believe without seeing. Right. Because I've done the studies, uh, I, I know the studies, 50% of people have had religious experiences in their life. 50% of believers, many of your viewers, have had some type of a, a voice, an angel, a religious experience, an anointing with the Holy Spirit. But 50% haven't. And let me say that I think that 50% that haven't have a, probably a stronger faith. Right. Blessed are you who believe without seeing. Absolutely. Because Could you be. haven't had those manifestations. I was of the type that I was, uh, like I said, I had fallen away. Right. I was far from you God. You needed something I like something I needed something dramatic. To get you to but a lot of people need something dramatic and don't have it. But I go back to the 12-step uh, 12 12 ministry. Mm -hmm. It's all about an awakening. Right. some type of an awakening with God. And that's how you come out of your addiction, you come into recovery. Why do some people get it and other people don't? I really don't know that's in the mystery of God, but let me say, trust God. You also write here, you say, people will often say, as we were just discussing, how can a loving God send people to hell? What I discovered through this experience is that God doesn't send anyone to hell, rather we judge ourselves. Yeah, that's... The secrets in the light of God's face, that's from the psalm. Our secrets will be revealed in the light of God's face. What happens is when you mm -hmm. stand before God, the beatific vision, his glory, his light, his, his magnificence, 
God doesn't judge you, you judge yourself. It's, it's like standing in the presence of mm -hmm. somebody beautiful. You realize your shortcomings, but especially with God. I've heard it said that if the president walked into the room, everybody would stand. Mm -hmm. But if Jesus walked into the room, everybody would kneel. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. It's the fear of the Lord. You, you realize your impurities, your imperfections. Yet, I talk about the mercy of God there, mm -hmm. his forgiveness, his love. That's why we need Jesus. We need his death on the cross for us. That's how we're justified. But we still have to work mm -hmm. at being purified, at gaining virtue, at becoming holy. And by the way, uh, I do write about purgatory in here that our purgation is the meaning of life. Mm -hmm. And if we're not ready, God will give us more time. Purgatory, as it says in the Catechism, is a place of grace where we are purged further in order to mm -hmm. attain the holiness we need to stand before God. So you're really hitting a good mm -hmm. subject there. Let, let me ask you, so when you need gas for your car, do you wait till the last minute or do you go early? <laughs> I go early. Because <laughs> uh, there was some disc story in here about the, the reverend and the, and the guy at the gas station. Yeah, I tell right? a little joke there, yeah. The people wait till the last minute to try to get holy. It's a, it's a lifestyle. It's a process, and you've got to be invested in it now mm -hmm. so that you will be ready. I want to talk about Advent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm airing some of my programs in Advent on EWTN. Mm -hmm. I air my programs for Lent on EWTN. Lent and Advent, and this is our beauty, the beauty of our Catholic Church, it's a season of preparation. Mm -hmm. And in the season of preparation, we're trying to get ready for Easter. We're mm -hmm. trying to get ready for the Second Coming. We're trying to get ready for Christmas. That's the purpose of life, getting ready, being prepared for our final vision. Right. Making sure we got the right wedding vision. garments, right? Uh, we got the right garments on there. That's right. You say, for Christians, death ought not to be dreaded, but accepted and embraced as a means of our final growth and wholeness. You go on to say, death is a natural part of life. Jesus taught that unless a grain of wheat dies, etc. Of course, some people say, well, that's the thing. That This is the, old, you know, you'd hear from Marx or somebody and say, the opiate of the people. It's a way of keeping people yeah. down. They don't have to worry about what's going on in this life because they're, they're, it's going to be wonderful in the next. Well, it, it's true. It will be wonderful in the next, but we it's not the opium of the people. Rather, it's the, the work of the people. That's what liturgy is, the work of the people. We, we work at holiness. Mm -hmm. We work at being prepared. We work at worshiping God. And as we do that, mm -hmm. we become purified. I think about Mother Angelica mm -hmm. in EWTN. The call to be a sister, the call to be a nun, the call to be a religious as I am, it's a call to perfection, uh, perfecte caritas, the call to, to love, to become virtuous, to forgive. That's work. Mm -hmm. That's not easy to do. Right. That's no opium. That's hard work. And that's exactly what we're called to. I thought this was interesting. You, you, you say the Christian journey of life is actually a pilgrimage of healings. How so? Well, really, when God touches us through the Holy Spirit, through his mercy, through forgiveness, go to the sacrament of reconciliation, I've learned that the sacraments are healing sacraments. You go to communion, and at that moment right after communion, there's a time of healing, a time of blessing. You go to the sacrament of reconciliation, you're forgiven your sins and your guilt. Mm -hmm. That's a time of healing. The Holy Spirit touches you, that's a time of healing. It was St. Francis of Assisi who said, Sister Death, the final healing. Mm -hmm. We are broken in our bodies. We go through all kinds of sufferings and all kinds of diseases. Death, you talk to some elderly people, they are welcoming death, they're ready to go. It is their time and it's like the final healing. Mm -hmm. So in a way, death isn't to be dreaded so much as to be welcomed as a time mm -hmm. where we're gonna go before God for the final healing. And let me throw this in. As we remember on the cross, Jesus said to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. There's an immediacy at your mm -hmm. death when you come before God, there's a today to it. And we believe that there will be a comfort, God's mercy and compassion at the moment of our death. This comes from one of the Psalms. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful. Mm -hmm. So at our death, there will be a precious moment of compassion and healing. Some of you are near to your death and you're afraid. And I can tell you, trust God. He will compassionately receive you. He will not forget your faith. He will love you into new life. In a section uh, 
of death and overview. You talk about don't be led astray. You talk a little bit about New Age and kind of yeah. Eastern religions. Yeah. And you talk about the idea of reincarnation, and obviously, from a Christian perspective, it's just not true. Right. You go out and give uh, lots Church of retreats missions, yeah. and, and missions. Do you run into even Catholics or who kind of think, well, it's kind of like the circle of life, you know? You are so right. Unfortunately, some Catholics embrace everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what I don't like about the near-death experiences that I've read about, many of these, they're so new age-ish, you mm -hmm. know, God as you envision them, you know, this being of light. What I encountered was God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, exactly what our Catholic Church teaches. Reincarnation is absolutely false. Jesus never taught about it. None of the saints ever proclaimed it. It is a false doctrine. What we have to be careful of is watering down the truth mm -hmm. with a lot of different uh, ideas that come from society. And thank you for bringing that up because there is one truth. And it says in the letter to the Hebrews, mm -hmm. we die once, we die once, mm -hmm. and then comes the judgment. Right. Every other world religion focuses on a person coming to the afterlife through a cycle of rebirth or through obedience or through adherence to a set of precepts or even through following God's will. Christianity differs drastically in that the believer enjoys the afterlife because of Jesus. Absolutely. Our religion is a religion of redemption. We are redeemed. We are in Christ. We are baptized into Christ. He is the firstborn. He is the, the forerunner. As he has died and risen, we die and rise in him. It's Christocentric. Mm -hmm. It's all about Jesus. Well, it's interesting, too, because you, you talk about, you make a comment, the occult may seem innocent and harmless, but those who participate in it are toying with evil. And you were talking about that television show that had been popular a while ago called Crossing Over. So there's this interest. People want to communicate with their loved ones. They yeah. want to know what's going on, but sometimes they're going about it the wrong way. And you even talk about, I think it was Saul, uh, right, uh, with the prophet, King Saul consulted the dead prophet Samuel through the witch of Endor. And even though that might sound like it wasn't a bad idea because of who was involved, it wasn't a good idea. It led to his downfall. And I talk to people all the time who want to communicate with their, uh, their dead son or their spouse or whatever it is. And that's where that phrase, trust God, comes in. Don't go toward the occult. Especially, I, I hate to say this, but I do a lot of work in ministry in New Orleans. There seems to be a spiritualism <laughs> there in New Orleans I don't get. And I've seen it right outside the cathedral where you've got these fortune tellers and right. people that want to, you know, read your palms and all that. Stay away from that type of stuff. That w leaves you open to evil in your life. Right. You also mentioned the fact here, what do Christians believe about death in <clears throat> the first thing? And you kind of mentioned this earlier, that Christianity is a religion full of hope. Yes, absolutely. In fact, it says in First Peter, we have a living hope. The purpose of our life now on earth is geared toward after we die. Certainly, we live, we live well now, but we are geared toward eternity. Now, here's a mouthful. I'll say these words, mm -hmm. eternal life. We're talking about forever, and it's endless. And we have, that's the meaning and purpose. We have to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. We have such hope. That's what Easter is all about. Now, in, in writing this book, you talk about the fact that you talk about grieving. And, 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 and how people should grieve. And you had your own, you kind of mentioned your dad's passing, etc. How do people grieve? Why is it important to understand how to grieve? I talk about a phrase called grieve well. Mm -hmm. When we grieve, when we lose somebody we love, I lost my mom and dad and that really hurt, we go through stages. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote profusely about this. She wrote a book called On Death and Dying and On Grief and Grieving. And she talks about stages of loss that we go through, denial and bargaining and anger, and then finally coming to acceptance. And when we grieve, we go through shock and we go through bewilderment, we go through confusion. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do is finally, through the grace of God, come to acceptance. We have to move forward with our life and go beyond and, and live the life that our loved one would want us to live. I do talk about grieving in this book, mm -hmm. but primarily this book is about the death mm -hmm. experience. It's also near the end you talk about, in a way, we all have been given an envelope with an RSVP from the Lord. Yes, yeah, an invitation to live well. It's an invitation for hope. It's an invitation to become the best that you can be because we will all, we will all stand before the throne of God. The beatific vision is what this is all mm -hmm. about, and we must be prepared. 
I wanted to share very quickly about God himself. In this book, mm -hmm. I talk about God. Everybody has their own idea about who God is and what God is. I was filled with love, intimate, affectionate, personal love. I've been loved by my parents, I've been loved by girlfriends, but it drenched me, mm -hmm. glory, really quickly. I noticed in the monstrance here in the chapel at EWTN, the monstrance shows the splendor coming forth from the real presence. Right. That's in a, a sign of the magnificence, the, the glory, the pleasure, mm -hmm. the joy of God that radiates mm -hmm. from his presence. I feel that with the Holy Spirit. I'm feeling it right now as I talk to you, Doug. It's the power of God that will raise us from the dead. God is magnificent, glorious, and love. Right. The end does come as it does for this program. Death, the final surrender. Father Cedric Pesenia, CP. Thank you, Father, for joining us here on the show. Don't forget the book is available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com, all things Catholic. I'm Doug Keck. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time here on Bookmark. The book just discussed is available through the EWTN Religious Catalog website. To order your copy, log on to www.ewtn.com forward slash catalog.